So looking at Reconstruction Part 2, we're continuing on from yesterday. We know that the Civil War ends. Uh, President Abraham Lincoln is going to try to reunify both the North and the South before he's really given the opportunity to do so. Um, he is assassinated and Andrew Johnson, as a result, becomes the presidency. During this Reconstruction era, you have the Reconstruction Amendments that get passed. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. 14th Amendment gives citizenship to all uh, former slaves. And then the 15th Amendment gives all men the right to vote. But again, it does leave out the women. So the question we kind of have to ask ourselves, especially when we're looking at Reconstruction, is all are all, all excuse me are all men created equal? And we hear this, you know, get reiterated, especially like in the Declaration of uh, Independence and the Constitution, that you know we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. But we know that that doesn't necessarily always take place. And, and normally I like to have discussions with students like this of, you know, are all men created equal? And even though we use the term men, of course, we're referring to women as well. And I think what ultimately students kind of come to an agreement on is that we're all born equal. We're not necessarily treated equally. And sometimes people are born and have easier lives than others. Somebody who's born really rich is probably going to have an easier life than somebody who was born really poor. You know, somebody who... Um, you know, probably has a better, you know, education is, is going to have a better life than someone who maybe doesn't have like a great education. But, you know, I think most people would agree that even though we're born equally, we're not necessarily treated equally. And I think that that's definitely very true, especially when we're looking at what's going to happen to the former slaves after the Civil War. So when we're looking at the freedmen, a lot of free blacks, or what they call freedmen, are in a very perplexing situation. And we can kind of look to Solomon Northrup in 12 Years a Slave and just how his situation is. You know, he was a free black who obviously gets kidnapped and sold into slavery. And every time he tries to tell somebody his story of, you know, hey, I, I am a, you know, a free black man and this is a mistake and blah, 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 they... They whip him, they beat him, and, and he really never gets an opportunity to have his story heard. At one point, he has that white man who um, comes onto Master Ford's plantation. He sort of feels like, hey, this is kind of a little bit of a sign of hope. I'm going to give him this letter, and he's going to turn this in for me, and someone's going to realize that, you know, I'm a free black man. And then, of course, that doesn't end up working out, um, especially when he turns on him and reports him to Master Ford. Solomon was obviously educated. He could read and write, but a lot of people told him it's dangerous if they know you can read and write, so you really need to sort of keep that to yourself. And even once the Civil War ends and slavery is abolished, a lot of former slaves don't really know exactly what to do. A lot of them had heard they were free, but most still stay on the plantation where they'd always lived because they really had nowhere else to go and they had no other life. Again, most of these former slaves, they couldn't read or write. And that's where that term sort of comes in of ignorance is bliss and, and why a lot of people had warned Solomon throughout 12 Years a Slave of do not pe tell people you can read and write because they're going to know that you're educated. And if they know that you're educated, you're going to get the other sort of former slaves kind of riled up and, and try to rebel against these plantations uh, masters. And obviously, you know, the Southern whites didn't really necessarily want that. Um, so a lot of them sort of end up staying behind and just working for their former masters because, again, they didn't know any better. They, they didn't have any education. They didn't really know where else they could go. So a lot of them stayed behind. You have some that are going to flee towards the north where things were better. It didn't necessarily mean northerners weren't racist. There certainly were quite a few that were. But again, they had always been pretty much anti-slavery. So for a lot of these former slaves, they would get kind of a little bit of a better start in the north than they would the south. Um, of course, not everyone's able to flee because, again, in order to move, you need money. And you've been working for free your whole life. It's not like you can just sort of uproot everything and go. So it was very difficult for former slaves to just uproot and leave the south. South, and many of them are not able to do so. You do have some blacks that kind of let their frustrations erupt by destroying white homes, the land. Um, sometimes they would turn the, you know, turn the whip on their former masters and, and whip them themselves, you know, kind of like a little bit of revenge. Um, you know, we, we even kind of hear a couple of stories of that, you know, with, uh, you know, slaves while they were on the plantation. You would hear women, they would take buttons um, from like the master's wife and like them stealing buttons and keeping them for themselves was, was almost kind of like a, a little way to signify that like, yeah, I may be a slave, but I, I'm still going to find a way to get you back. And almost kind of think about it like when you get pulled over by a cop and then like as you're driving away, you're like cussing out the cop, like you still got your ticket, but you kind of feel a little better that you 
you got to say what you maybe didn't feel like you could say in, in front of the cop itself. And, and so I feel like that's kind of what some former slaves, you know, really sort of got to do when slavery is officially abolished. What's going to be created during this Reconstruction period is going to be known as the Freedmen's Bureau. Because again, you have to remember, all these free slaves, they're largely unskilled, so they knew how to work the fields, or unless they were a woman, most of the time they worked in the house, not all of them. We see that in 12 Years a Slave with Patsy, she works the field and is really a lot more successful than all of the men. But majority of them are uneducated. Solomon Northrop would be an, an exception to that rule. Frederick Douglass was also an exception to that rule. Um, so Frederick Douglass was educated by his former master's wife, um, which if she had been caught doing so, it would have been incredibly illegal and she would have gotten in, well, it was illegal. She would have gotten in major trouble. Um, but she did teach Frederick Douglass to read and write, which is why he becomes really one of the main leaders of that abolitionist movement, that banning of slavery throughout the United States. Um, and so... Again, that was the exception. It wasn't the rule. So many of these, you know, now former slaves, other than knowing how to work the field, they, they didn't have any skills. They weren't educated. They weren't trained. And Congress sort of realizes we, we need to kind of come up with something to help sort of bridge that gap, whether it's giving them some type of education or, or giving them something to give on their feet. Again, they also don't have any money because they've been working for free pretty much their whole lives. So the point of the Bureau was essentially, it was an early form of welfare. So it's providing food, clothing, health care, and education. And their success was really sort of minimal at best because, especially in the South, there weren't a lot of people who were in support of the Freedmen's Bureau. Because again, the South isn't happy that they lost the war. They're also not happy that they lost their slaves. So a lot of people that worked for the Freedmen's Bureau and were stationed throughout the South were really like social workers where they would go, they would check in, they would try to help and provide where they could. Um, but a lot of them received harassment, um, especially from groups like the KKK, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the Freedmen's Bureau was not very successful. And of course, Southerners were not a fan of the Freedmen's Bureau. One kind of benefit that comes out of the sort of Reconstruction period is because a lot of white Southerners weren't able to vote, um, they, again, they become disenfranchised. You're going to have blacks for the first time. They're going to be elected to Congress and really get an opportunity to represent themselves. Before this, that didn't really happen because, again, they weren't considered um, people. They were considered property. But by the 1870s, you're going to have blacks that are officially going to start being elected into Congress by this point, no woman has been elected yet. It's not until 1916 that the first woman is actually going to be elected to Congress. And of course, white Southerners kind of now had a little bit of a problem. Without slavery, how could they ensure a stable labor force? And so really, they're going to turn to this, uh, this process known as sharecropping. So it's a system of agricultural in which a landowner allows a tenant to use the land in return for a share of the, of the crop produced on the land. So 50%. And most sharecroppers were in continuous debt. So basically, look at it this way. Let's just say I gave you the land that Temesco Canyon sits on. But you as a person, you get all that land. And we'll just assume the buildings aren't there. And you can grow whatever it is that you want. And we live in Southern California. So things like oranges, kind of any citrus foods, lemons, limes, avocados are going to grow really well on that land. But of course, you can buy that land. So you, are, you have that land, but you're in debt to me. And I'm telling you that 50% of everything that gets produced on that area of Tabasco Canyon High School, again, whether it's oranges, lemons, limes, avocados, whatever it may be, automatically goes to me. The rest of it, you can go ahead and sell yourself. But if you're only keeping 50% of what it is that you grow, are you ever going to be able to pay me back, the person who gave you this land? And the short answer is no, you're going to be in continuous debt. So this sharecropping method is really what's get used by a lot of these former plantation owners of we're going to give you this former slave this land. We know you know how to work it because that's kind of like the one skill that you do have. But 50% of everything that gets produced automatically goes to me. And then the rest of it, you can go ahead and keep. But that money is going to be used to provide food for yourself, provide clothing, housing, all that stuff. The chances of these sort of former slaves being able to save that money and buy back the land was going to be pretty much close to impossible. So sharecropping becomes a really popular method in the South. You're also going to have black codes that get enacted. So these are local laws passed to keep free men in subservient positions. So they are banned from serving on juries, holding local office, and arresting them for idleness. So if they were just hanging around, they could be arrested. Um, 
We kind of see this a little bit with Solomon Northrop. He was not able to testify in a court of law against the people um, that had kidnapped him because he was a black man. And really until about the eight or not 18, the 1950s and 1960s, um, black people are not going to be allowed to serve on jurors. Um, so a case that I had mentioned when we went over the double jeopardy clause to the Fifth Amendment with Emmett Till. So when Emmett Till was killed by two white men, the entire jury was 12 white men. Um, and so obviously, because it was the 1950 South, they weren't going to convict these two white men of killing a black kid. And so as a result, they are going to be acquitted. Jim Crow laws, and this should sound pretty familiar. Um, these are laws that created segregation of the races in public places. So pl things like schools, railroads, restaurants, doctor's offices, things like that. I mean, you have tons of different laws, these you know Jim Crow laws that exist in the South of blacks and whites can't go to the same doctor, they can't use the same lawyer, they can't have the same books, they can't have the same schools. And most of us look at that going, that's definitely illegal and that's definitely unconstitutional. But for a very long time, those laws are going to be held up in a case that becomes known as Plessy versus Ferguson. If you look at the left here, this here is Homer Plessy. And Homer Plessy was only one-eighth black. But in the South, there was this belief in what we call the one-drop rule. If that if you had an ancestor that was black, then you yourself were automatically considered black. So Homer Plessy is one-eighth black basically probably means his great-great-grandmother or grandfather was black. So even though he could pass technically as a white man, um, he was considered black because of it. Some people might think that that's like an archaic rule, like this idea of like the one drop rule, but there are some people who still believe in it. One of the most famous, I believe, would be Halle Berry, who's an actress. Uh, she's been in X-Men, James Bond. Um, she's done quite a few films, but she is half black and half white. Her first daughter she had with the white man, so her daughter's technically 25% black. And she did an interview with a magazine and said, my daughter's black and I firmly believe in the one drop rule and, and so on and so forth. So for some people, this idea of that one drop rule isn't necessarily like archaic and, and far-fetched. So Homer Plessy, being a one-eighth black man, he decides that he's going to basically pull a Rosa Parks before he pulls a Rosa Parks. Railroad carts were segregated because at this time you don't really have like buses and things like that. So he decides he's going to sit in the front of this railway railway car. Um, they tell him he needs to move to the back. He refuses. As a, as a result, he gets arrested. This, of course, was intentionally done. The point of that of Homer Plessy, you know, sitting in an all white railway car was to challenge these Jim Crow laws. And this is going to go to the Supreme Court. And in this Plessy versus Ferguson case, they are going to uphold those Jim Crow laws. And what the Supreme Court says is that separate but equal is constitutional. So blacks and whites can go to separate schools. That's constitutional because they both have schools. Blacks and whites can eat at separate restaurants because they both get a chance to access food. Blacks and whites can go to separate doctor's offices because at the end of the day, they're both going to get a doctor. Now, is this really equal? No, we know that this isn't going to be true, but... Plessy versus Ferguson takes place in 1896. It's not overturned until 1954 with Brown versus Board of Education. This you don't really need to sort of write down. I think most of you guys know who the Ku Klux Klan is or the KKK. Uh, on the left here is Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, he's the first Grand Wizard of the KKK. If you have ever seen Forrest Gump, and he mentions in the beginning of the movie, you know, I was named after my great, 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 great grandfather, Nathan Bedford Forrest. This is who he's referring to. The KKK is going to come into fruition um, during this Reconstruction period, and it was really during the during the Reconstruction period as well as the 1920s when the Ku Klux Klan is, is going to be, a, you know, at their sort of highest popularity. The KKK is still around today. They obviously aren't as popular as they used to be. Um, most of us would consider them a hate group. They actually don't consider themselves a hate group at all. They consider themselves a, a Christian group. Um, I was watching an interview once with a, a leader of the KKK, and he's being interviewed by an immigrant woman. She's like, doesn't the, the Bible teach you to love thy neighbor? And he goes, no, no, no. It says, love thy neighbor, thy people. He goes, my people are white. They're not you. So even though a lot of us look at the Ku Klux Klan as being a hate group, they themselves don't consider themselves to be a hate group. They consider themselves to be a Christian group. Um, of course, they don't just hate blacks. They hate anybody who's really essentially not white and Christian. So if you're Jewish, Hispanic, um, you know, Buddhist, whatever it may be, they're essentially not a fan of you. Um, normally, I would show this in class, but I can't because it's really hard to show recorded 
clips in general, but if you kind of want a funny KKK scene and you're not going to be offended by adult language, I would highly recommend um, that you watch the clip from Django Unch Unchained and type in KKK scene. But it's a Quentin Tarantino movie that came out about eight years ago, um, and they kind of make fun of like the first meeting of the KKK. So if you want something that's kind of sort of funny and you're not going to be offended by the F-bomb being dropped quite a bit, I'd recommend that you watch it on YouTube. It's, it's pretty hilarious. And of course, the KKK is very famous for their costumes and their white hoods. And in that article we read with Daryl Davis um, at the beginning of the school year, as well as the TED Talk that we watched, you know, he took a lot of pride in being able to get these robes um, from the former Ku Klux Klan members. Let's get this part. And of course, the heritage of Reconstruction. To many in the South, the shame of Reconstruction was worse than the war itself. And the war in Reconstruction also bred generations of animosity. And the the lot of many Southern blacks, despite good intentions, was likely as bad or even worse um, than before the war. So even though, you know, the intention of abolishing slavery was to create some equality for these former slaves, unfortunately, we know that that's not going to happen. And things are really going to come up to a height, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, when the civil rights movement really takes off and, and starts chipping away at these Jim Crow laws. The Confederate flag, of course, has been very controversial, um, and you've been seeing that quite a bit in the news, really for the last few years. There are some people who see it as sort of a representation of, of the South and of Southern pride. A lot of other people see it as racist, saying that it represents slavery um, and being a I guess, pro-slavery person, or at least believing that slavery wasn't necessarily a bad thing, or that if you have it, that you're racist. I would say that the Confederate flag, I think, means different things to many different people. Um, my first year when I was teaching, um, I was student teaching, I had a kid who had the Confederate flag on his backpack, and in my mind, I'm like, oh my god, this kid's a racist, like, what am I going to do? And, but he was really friendly, like, you know, this one black girl in class, I was like, okay, maybe he's not racist. So one day I just decided to ask him about it. I was like, hey, Jared, can I ask you something? He goes, is it the Confederate flag in my backpack? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I'm not a racist. I said, I, I had a feeling you weren't. And he goes, no. He's like, I do get questions about it. And he was like, I just kind of believe in and what the South stood for was that, you know, states' rights over federal rights. He was like, you know, I'm not someone who believes in big government. I feel like the state should be able to take control of things and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, obviously, I don't, you know, I don't believe in slavery. And I, I think it's great that they abolish it. He goes, but I do believe that the South was fighting for, you know, states' rights over federal rights. And that was something that he supported. So... It does mean different things to different people, um, but the Confederate flag is, is definitely quite controversial. In Mississippi, an image of the Confederate flag had been on their state flag for, you know, well over 100 years, and they just voted to go ahead and remove that and come up with a new state flag. So I think when you start hearing conversations about the Confederate flag, as well as people honoring former Confederate soldiers, um, you know, and taking those statues down, it, it's going to be a conversation that really continues.